Who can forget the endless hype for Prometheus? It was supposed to be Ridley Scott's grand return to the franchise that began his career, Alien. Here, he would resurrect the franchise from the pits of those Alien vs. Predator films and answer all those pestering fan questions like, where did the aliens come from and who was that dead giant space jockey? Plus, with an all-star cast, how could the film fail? It was a sure thing destined to spawn a new franchise, and yet, people were pretty disappointed. So much so that when the sequel Alien Covenant was released, barely anyone showed up, effectively killing this sure-to-be franchise. Most people criticize these prequels for two major reasons. One, all the unimaginably stupid decisions the human characters make, which... Charlie, don't be an idiot. She is beautiful. Oh, yeah, there are quite a lot of. And two, because Prometheus and Alien Covenant raise a lot of lofty questions. Where do we come from? What is our purpose? What happens when we die? But then never bother to answer them, or to be honest, really even try to. So it seems like they're just pseudo-intellectual nonsense, as if just by raising a couple Philosophy 101 questions, somehow the films will become inherently deep. But is that really the case? Well, let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on Prometheus and Alien Covenant, deep or dumb. And yep, spoilers ahead. Before we get started, a question we keep getting asked is, whatever happened to Earthling Cinema? Well guys, it's still around, it's just on a new channel. If you're not familiar, Earthling Cinema is a wisecrack show where a smart-ass alien from the future analyzes the culture of a long-destroyed Earth, mostly its movies. Well, it's moved to its own channel, and we've renamed it Alien's Guide since it's about so much more than cinema now. In addition to tackling films like Captain America Civil War and Sharknado, Garrix is branching out into television, anime, and a new sub-series called Earthling Culture where he dives into things like Disneyland. I've always loved this show, and I feel like it's gotten even better since we launched the new channel. So you're not going to want to miss the new episodes we got coming out soon. Garrix is going to cover something that people have requested a lot, The Office, and he's got a lot to say about the paper business. There's a link below to subscribe, so be sure to check it out. And now, back to the show. Alright guys, let's get started with a recap. Prometheus begins in the early 21st century as a group of humans, plus one android obsessed with Lawrence of Arabia, travel to a distant planet in search of their makers, an alien race known as the Engineers. However, when our motley crew of space travelers reach the planet, they discover a strange military base used to create bioweapons. The crew gets exposed to some of the black gooey stuff and turn on one another. Meanwhile, that Peter O'Toole-looking android David discovers one of the engineers in cryosleep. Turns out the engineers were none too happy with their creation and were actually planning to release the black goo on Earth to wipe us all out. Sometimes to create, one must first destroy. When David wakes the engineer up, he tries to do just that, prompting Idris Elba to sacrifice himself, leaving our final girl Shaw on a mission to discover just why humanity's creators were so keen on pulling the plug. Yet by the time Alien Covenant comes around, Shaw's already dead and David has wiped out the engineer's planet using the black goo to create, you guessed it, the alien. And yeah, that's pretty much all that happens in the entire two hour sequel and most of it happens off screen. So what's actually going on in these films? An early flashback to Shaw's childhood begins to tease out the answer. Why did he die? Sooner or later everyone does. Where do they go? Everyone has their own word. Heaven. Paradise. Whatever it's called. Someplace beautiful. How do you know it's beautiful? Shaw, like all the human characters in these prequels, is obsessed with the search for knowledge. For her, the answer to our existential questions, where do we come from, what happens after death, lie in the sky. After discovering a star map, she and her lover Holloway convince tech billionaire Peter Whelan to fund an expedition in search of their creators, who they believe can answer life's mysteries. But this search for ultimate knowledge is presented as inherently destructive. Look no further than the film's title. In Greek mythology, Prometheus bestows humanity with the forbidden knowledge of fire, only to be cursed by the gods for doing so. Chained to a rock, Prometheus's liver is ripped out and eaten day after day. All because he gave us fire. Our first true piece of technology. 
This parallels one of our most famous biblical stories, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis. You know the deal, Adam and Eve, seduced by a serpent, eat from the tree of knowledge only to be cast out from the Garden of Eden forever. Similarly, in Prometheus and Covenant, humans seek forbidden knowledge. Where do they come from? What happens after death? Only to be punished for seeking those answers in the first place. The crew releases a toxic black goo, dooming them all, and it's no accident that the first form this goo takes is a serpent. All the human characters are presented as reckless, if not just stupid, in their single-minded pursuit for answers. Explore the alien planet, die. Reach out to the alien serpent, die. Peer within the alien egg, you get the picture. Given Shaw's just watched all her crewmates die horribly, you'd think she'd learn this lesson, but still, no. Even by the end of Prometheus, she's consumed by the need for answers, albeit to a different question now. They created us. Then they tried to kill us. They changed their minds. I deserve to know why. Leading to... The search for knowledge just for knowledge's sake ultimately pits humanity against their own creators, the engineers. The engineers live by an ethos rooted in self-sacrifice. The first time they're introduced, one kills himself to create life in a barren world. Normally we think of God as immortal, but equally prevalent is the myth of the dying and rising God. In James Fraser's book, The Golden Bough, he details how, in many cultures, a god voluntarily dies, then is reborn for the sake of their creation. Think of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for the sins of humanity, only to rise two days later. In fact, the engineers are directly tied to Jesus. In an interview, Ridley Scott revealed that our Lord and Savior in earlier drafts was an engineer, his crucifixion being the reason that the engineers turned on humans. But if the engineer's philosophy is rooted in self-sacrifice, then humanity's is the opposite. They want to prolongate life at all costs. This ethos is best reflected by Peter Wayland, who with only a few days of life left, freezes himself so he can meet his maker to save him. Save you? From what? Death, of course. When humanity does finally meet its maker, things don't go according to plan. No! The engineers become incensed with their creation for perverting their ideology in the pursuit of immortality. As such, they decide to just wipe us out and be done with it. Meanwhile, for the humans, meeting their maker is pretty underwhelming. Imagine meeting God and it's just some tall dude with ripped abs intent on killing you. This understandably provokes quite the existential crisis. Holloway turns to the bottle, Shaw renounces her faith, and Wayland, well, he gets smashed in the head. In the end, humanity's search for answers only leads to death or worse, disappointment. David, the central character of the prequels, becomes the symbol for this disappointment. Just like the humans, he searches for knowledge, studying his creators, researching their films, music, languages, and culture. He even mimics their behavior, wearing a helmet out into alien terrain. David, why are you wearing a suit, man? I beg your pardon? You don't breathe, remember? So, why wear a suit? And yet, the humans treat David, an android, like a lowly servant, making him fetch tea or pour a glass of whiskey, or just directly insulting him. You, boy, you're coming with us. I'd be delighted. It's no surprise then that David too becomes frustrated in the answers his creators provide. Why do you think your people made me? We made you because we could. Can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? So what happens in the face of such disappointment, when the answer to life's mysteries are revealed to just be, eh, because we could? Well, things get pretty nihilistic. As Wayland dies, he confides, yes. to which David replies, I know. For David, his supposed god, humanity, is a dying species unworthy of creation or resurrection. They don't deserve to start again, and I'm not going to let them. He was human entirely unworthy of his creation. And humanity's creators, the engineers, are the same. As such, David rebels against both. He kills the humans Holloway and Shaw, then wipes out the entire engineer civilization. Afterwards, looking out at the ruins of the engineer's planet, David snidely quotes Percy Shelley's poem, Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. The poem contrasts a haughty plaque describing a booming civilization with the reality now surrounding it, a colossal wreck. Similarly, the engineer's supposed marvelous civilization has been reduced to ash. 
they just as impermanent as their human creations. In the absence of meaning or God, David aspires to be a kind of Nietzschean Ubermensch, rejecting a nihilistic lack of values, crafting his own values in their place, and morphing from creation to creator. This transformation is symbolized through what else but an 1800s opera. When David is first born, he plays Wagner's Entry of the Gods into Valhalla for his creator Wayland. The entry of the Gods into Valhalla. A little anemic without the orchestra. But as he creates his own xenomorphs, he orders the ship to play the same musical accompaniment for him. Welcome. How may I help you? How about some music, mother? Selection. Richard Wagner. Das Rheingold. Act two. The entry of the gods into Valhalla. Completing his transformation into God. To David, neither humanity nor the engineers are worthy of creating life. But David, undying, is different. Unlike these fallen creators, David will remain chiseled Michael Fassbender forever. You seek your creator. I am looking at mine. I will serve you, yet you are human. You will die. I will not. Ultimately, David's search for answers leaves him so disappointed that he decides to just create his own perfect life form, the Xenomorph. And are you that next visionary? I'm glad you said it. But is David right in his convictions? Alien Covenant carefully pokes holes in David's supposed superiority. For instance, David misattributes Ozymandias to Lord Byron, when in fact it was written by Percy Shelley. Who wrote Ozymandias? Byron. Shelley. With this mistake, David is revealed to not be a perfect all-knowing god, but just as fallible as the humans and engineers. In fact, throughout Alien Covenant, David's depicted not as god, but as the devil. When David tries to convert his fellow android Walter to his side, he quotes John Milton's Paradise Lost. It's your choice now, brother. I am only in heaven or reign in hell. A quote which Lucifer says in the book. Heck, Orem even straight up calls David the devil. David, I met the devil when I was a child, and I've never forgotten him. So what happens next when David creates the Xenomorphs? Has he finally created the perfect life form? Or will the Xenomorphs turn on him just like he did to the humans before? Alien Covenant only provides some slight hints to an answer mostly again in the form of its title. In biblical terms, a covenant is a formal agreement made by God with a religious community or with humanity in general. In Prometheus, we see various covenants fall apart, between the engineers and humans, and between humans and android. But in Alien Covenant, a new alliance is struck between David and his creation, the Xenomorph. Look no further than the Xenomorph birth sequence. As the alien bursts out of Orem's chest, it looks to its master, David. David raises his arms, and the Xenomorph copies him, raising its arms in a mirror image, which admittedly is pretty silly. Hello, my baby! Hello, my honey! Hello, my raccoon gal! But in religious doctrines, a covenant between God and his creation is not an equal agreement. God initiates and determines the conditions of the arrangement, which humanity must accept as is. This relationship is inherently unequal, master to servant, which is exactly what David rebelled against, being a slave to humanity. What happens when Waylon is not around to program you anymore? I suppose I'd be free. And yet, David treats the xenomorphs just as humanity treated him. It is David that raises his hands, and the Xenomorph that must copy these actions. And when David sees his earlier creation, he informs Orem to... Breathe on the nostrils of a horse, and he'll be yours for life. As if the Xenomorph were a being to be trained into submission. It seems as if David is destined for a fall, for his own creation to reject his covenant, just as humanity and robot before. And yet, the movies never quite get there. This is probably because Ridley Scott planned the Alien prequels as a trilogy, so without the final chapter in David's journey, the themes and meaning behind these films don't feel fully formed. And unfortunately, after the disappointing box office returns of Covenant, it seems this trilogy may never reach its end. Now to be fair, this seems rather appropriate. In the search for all our answers to Prometheus and Alien Covenant's meanings, there is, in the end, no answer to be had. No! So are Prometheus and Alien Covenant deep 
or dumb. While there are certainly a lot of movies that quote profound poets just to sound intelligent, but at least in these prequels, the pretensions are motivated. You can criticize the films for sidelining the titular aliens or for being dull, but there's definitely careful thought in there. Except for why Shaw and Vickers don't just run to the side when the spaceship was crashing down. That was just dumb. Thanks so much for watching guys, and as I mentioned earlier, be sure to check out what we're doing over on the Aliens Guide channel. We put a lot of time and love into that show, and I'd love for people to see what it's all about, so head over and subscribe, and as always, peace.